Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for a beautiful sunny day. We're grateful for the mercies that you show us, Lord. And thank you for the, the team that has come back from Roatan and, and they're just bursting at the seams with the abundant blessings that you poured out on them while they were gone from us. And Lord, the, the ministry that they shared and how they poured into others and, and how others poured into them. And Lord, we look forward to, to hearing their stories uh, in the near future and they can share with us uh, what they what they were able to accomplish through your power while they were down there, Lord. And so now, Lord, we just ask for your your blessing as we as we open your Word and and glean from it what you have for us this morning as we get into further into the book of Hebrews. And Lord, just uh, cause it to change us and and mold us and guide us in the direction that we should go. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week, went up to the mailbox, get my mail, it was kind of a biggish envelope, and sorting through it as I got in, and it had those four letters that everyone dreads as they come to a certain point in their life, it said AARP. <laughs> so I know it's official now, I'm 50. So I opened it up and it said, man, you just, here's your card, they give you your card, this is your temporary card, and we'll get, we'll get you a permanent one here soon, and just need to send your check for $16, and you get all these benefits, and I'll get, I'll get uh, discounts on dentures, and <laughs> those little battery-operated mobility devices, and so I've arrived. Praise God, huh? Kind of a wake-up call. So it kind of, it kind of causes you to look back on your life. So, well, I guess halfway there, right? Or something. Hebrews chapter 3. So continuing the book of Hebrews, and the author is continuing his journey in this first two-thirds of the book on why Jesus is superior, why he's greater than anything else or anyone else. And, and in this chapter, we're going to talk about Moses a little bit. Moses was someone that was very highly regarded by the Jews. And, and so the author needs to set in order where Moses is on this whole spectrum. So we start in verse 1. It says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in, heavenly, in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. We're just going to stop there for a second. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share a heavenly calling. So this is written to brothers and, and sisters. The word actually can be translated either way. You who share a heavenly calling. These are, these are people who are believers, fellow believers. And he asked them to consider Jesus. Consider him. And, and it'd be easy to kind of gloss over those two words and move on to the next sentence, but I wanted to stop there for a minute and consider, do what he says. Consider Jesus. The Greek there means understand fully. You know, kind of let's, let's sit there and think about who Jesus is. It's kind of a cool way to share your faith. So you're talking to people about your faith. If you keep it focused on Jesus and who he is, and forget about religion and, and all that stuff and bad experiences they may have had in church. It takes a lot of that stuff off the table. And you focus on Jesus, and it, it, it completely sets a different tone for the discussion. And so we consider Jesus, and we ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about Jesus? And, and what did he say about himself? And who he was. What did those closest to him, those who ministered with him, what did they say about him? Even after he left the scene of the physical presence on the earth. And how did they live their lives after he was gone? Consider Jesus. Consider the impact that he has made on the people that follow him. Right? All of us. 
Consider the impact that he's made on us. Those of us who, who are really setting out to follow him. So if you have, have been down to Peru, Brian Vandercott, he's the pastor of, uh, of a Calvary Chapel down there in Lima. And he put an article up on Facebook this week that I really thought was cool. It's from the Atlantic Monthly magazine. And it talked about the new atheists. This new, that's kind of how they term themselves, but they, they, the author of this article did a study and talked to these people who are um, committed atheists, radical atheists. Like, like we might be radical followers of Jesus. These people take this stuff real seriously. And, and you tried to understand, well, what was it that caused you to go down this journey to becoming a committed atheist? Whatever that means. And, and what they found was that these were mainly... People in the, in the age of 18 to 30, let's say. Many of them students, college students. And, and what they longed for above all else was authenticity. Kids can see right through you. I found that out. My kids knew if I was being serious with them or not. They could see right through any artificiality. They have a nose for that. And these new atheists, having failed to find that authenticity in churches, they've settled for a non-belief that felt more genuine and attainable to them. This guy Michael that he, 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 he talked to at some length, he said, Christianity is something that if you really believed it, if you really believed it, it would change your life. And you would want to change the lives of others, right? If you really believed it, it would change your life and you would want to be all about changing the lives of others. And he said, I haven't seen too much of that. When I go to church and when he went to churches, he didn't see that. That radical discipleship, that radical following of Jesus. And the author of this article actually had an opportunity to, to debate up in Billings, Montana, this guy named Christopher Hitchens. Anybody familiar with who Christopher Hitchens was? He passed away last year. He was... Uh, very much an intellectual uh, author, journalist, uh, devout atheist, and, and loved to attack the church. And they actually held a debate up in Billings, Montana, and he asked Christopher Hitchens after the, the debate was over, why didn't you try to savage me on stage like you normally do to people who are representing Christianity? And his reply was immediate and emphatic. He says, you believe it. He knew he believed it. And so as we stop at this first part of the first verse, we consider Jesus and who he is and who his followers said he was and what they did with their lives as a result of that. And we've been talking about this a lot over the last few months. Consider Jesus and, and how that reflects into our lives. And it goes on in the verse, he says, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession who is faithful to him who appointed him. The apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus the apostle. You don't hear that very often, do we? But he was there as the apostle of the Father. He was there as an ambassador to the Father. And Jesus the high priest. But as we look in his ancestry, we see he's not a descendant of Levi, is he? He's not a descendant of Aaron, is he? He's from the tribe of what? Of who? Judah. So how can he be a high priest? Well, later on in Hebrews, it tells, tells us that Jesus was a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. The author says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So who is this guy, Melchizedek? If you turn to Genesis chapter 14, we find out who Melchizedek was. Melchizedek kind of makes a cameo appearance on the scene as Abraham is returning 
from a battle victoriously. Genesis chapter 14, verse 17, we'll start there. It says, after his return, after Abraham's return from the defeat of Kedor Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which means peace in Hebrew, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of the heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram, Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abraham, Abram, I'm sorry, gave him a tenth of everything. And now if we turn to Psalm 110. We see this brief appearance in the history of the Israelites of this priest, this king Melchizedek. And then he disappears. And all of a sudden in Psalm 110, which is a messianic psalm, it's actually quoted by Jesus. Verse 1 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is both a high priest and an apostle of our confession. We're all priests and ambassadors of our confession, are we not? 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we're all priests. We're a priesthood. And the word apostle simply means ambassador, one who is sent forth. We don't hold the office of apostle, but we all have been sent by Christ to go all, into, all of us into the world and preach the gospel, to be an ambassador for the one who sent us. In verse 2 it says, faithful to him who appointed him. Jesus carried out his mission right to the end. He was trustworthy. He said on the cross, it is, it is finished. And so we have been sent. We are ambassadors. We are priests. And we need to be faithful to our appointment as well. It goes on, and back in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Moses was also faithful. Think about Moses Forty years in the wilderness with the Jews and, and all that occurred during that time frame. Moses was faithful. He made mistakes, but he maintained his relationship and his ministry right to the end. I was thinking about that letter from AARP and, and thinking about what we've read so far. And I don't, I don't see a lot about retirement in the Bible. You know, I didn't see Moses kind of getting them up to the promised land and God dealt with him because of his sin in the wilderness and wasn't going to let him go through and he didn't decide to kind of build a little retirement home with some palm trees and a pool and you know those three wheeled bike things that get, get him to the, to the pool and back and I don't see it in there. Verse 3 says, For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The author's key point here is, not only is Jesus superior to angels, but he's superior to Moses as well. And the Jewish people had an issue with how much they regarded angels and how much they regarded Moses as compared to Christ. They were going back to what they used to believe. And the author is trying to get them back on point, back, back on focus. He says, Jesus is counted worthy of more glory. 
than Moses. Just as the builder of a house is worthy of more honor than the house itself. Makes sense. Jesus was involved in the creation of all things. Consider Jesus, the creator of all things. He even created the angels and Moses. So we don't need to worship Moses. We don't need to worship the house or the temple. We need to worship the creator. And so the point here is who is worthy of more honor? The creator or the creation? And what about today? You know, as we fast forward into our culture today and look at our lives, if we consider Jesus, well, let's consider our lives as well. I think it's healthy to do that. And, and look at how much honor and time and value do we put on created things versus our creator, right? We live in a society that puts much value, much honor on the things that are created rather than the creator. And as we examine our lives, as we consider ourselves, what do we spend our time on? What do we spend our money on? What do we spend our energy on? Where is our attention? Is it on the house or the builder of the house? As we look back over our lives, as I look back over 50 years, <laughs> as I look back over my life, As I look back, even on yesterday, what was my attention on? Was it on the builder or was it on the house? What's it all about? Because my Bible says that we too are ambassadors and priests. What do ambassadors do? Today, what do ambassadors do? They resent, represent, <laughs> some maybe resent, they, rep, they represent the ones who sent them. Right? That's what they do. So if you're an ambassador to a foreign country, you're there as a representative of the United States. You represent the one who sent you. And they often carry a message. They're often on some diplomatic mission when they go. There's a purpose for having an ambassador somewhere, isn't there? If we have an ambassador to Saudi Arabia, if we have an ambassador to Russia or Iran or China, there's a purpose for them to be there. They're there to represent our interests and we expect them to be active in that. They're not there to take care of their own interests and, and walk around and see the sights and enjoy themselves while they're living in that country at our expense. They're there for a purpose. They're there for a mission. So what about priests? What do priests do? If we are a priesthood, if we're a royal priesthood, what do priests do? And the answer is they minister, right? Priests minister. They offer service to God. They make sacrifice in the Old Testament. Romans 12.1 says, I appeal to you there, for brothers, by the mercies of God. To what? To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's part of being a priest, as you're offering yourself up as a living sacrifice. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So, Hebrews were called a royal priesthood. Peter calls us a holy priesthood. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Back in Hebrews chapter, uh, verse 4, it says, For every house is built by someone. But the builder of all things is God. Peter said that we're living stones. Living stones. 
Paul said that we are living sacrifices. Hebrews says that every house is built by someone. And I want the house that I am building with my life, the house that is the work of my life, that I labor on every day, I want that house to stand. Right? When my work is done here, I want my house to stand firm, steadfast, built with gold and silver and precious stones. That's what I, I, I yearn for. That's what I, my desire is. I, I, I rarely am successful at that, but that's what my goal is. I don't want to use hay and stubble anymore. I've tried that. It doesn't stand the test of time. It's going to burn, right? It's just frustrating building with that stuff. It just blows around. And it's, it's hard to keep it together. It's kind of itchy. It makes me sneeze. It's stubble. We ask somebody, so what are you using to build your house? Brick or stone or steel? No, man, I'm going to use some stubble. We're going to go with stubble. That's a decision we made because that's, you know, my neighbor's using stubble. Stubble seems to be working for him, so I'm going to use some stubble. Stubble is what I'm, I'm thinking about. No. With this one life that God has blessed me with, with this one life, this gift that God has blessed me with, I want to use it to build a house that is useful and lasting and something that brings honor to him. That's what I want to do. Every hour of every day, we are using our time and our energy and our money to build something. Right? We're building something every day. And the question is, what are we building? And since he has done so much for me, since he's died for me and gone to the cross for me, given up his life, and come down from heaven, and lived as a human being, and went through every temptation that I could possibly go through, and, and suffered at the hands of men, even to the cross, and gave his life for me, and rose again. And as I've, I, I've accepted that, I've, I, I've agreed with that, that he gave his life for me, and, and that he died for my sins, and I've simply made an effort to follow him, my life has been transformed, is continuing to be transformed. I want to invest all that I have left, all that I have left, into building a spiritual legacy and not investing my life in stubble. This life is not for me anymore. This life is for him. 1 Corinthians 15, turn there if you will. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He's talking about this. He's talking about that work that we do and, and what that should look like. And in verse 58 he says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. You don't hear that word much these days. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always, always, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. If you're not in the Lord, if you're laboring for something other than the Lord, I got news for you. It, it could be in vain. Abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the Lord, in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That's reassuring. That work that we do for the Lord is, is using gold and silver and precious stones. It's going to stand the test of time. And in verse 5, back in Hebrews, he goes on and says, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house. So back to the beginning of that verse. Moses was faithful in all God's house. Verse 6, But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And 
We are his house. If indeed, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. We're his house. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast. But just like Paul just said. Be steadfast and immovable. We're his house if we hold fast. So Moses again was faithful in God's house as a servant to testify. He was a foreshadowing of the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house. Again, as a son, he is superior to Moses. And we are his house. Our lives are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting or our glorying in our hope. Right? We need to hold fast. We need to finish well. As we've said before, being saved is an amazing experience. That's what we look for. But that's just the beginning. That's the beginning of the race for us. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 13. We're not going to go there, but he talked about the parable of the sower and how he scattered seed and on the different types of soil that that seed fell on. Whether it was rocky, whether it was fallen on sun-scorched earth or among the weeds, the thorns, or whether it was on the fertile soil. Some of those seeds sprouted up and got choked out or they got burned up or they got eaten by the birds. But some of it fell on a fertile soil and and grew and sunk down roots that were deep and grew up to bear fruit, right? And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, as Paul writes about, he's always talking about athletics, you know, and he's talking about the race. He's talking about straining toward that goal. That's the finish line. Forgetting what lies behind. Made some mistakes. God's forgiven me for those. But I want to strain toward what's ahead of me now. I'm running that race. I see that finish line. It's not too much further. And I want, to, I want to grow across that tape like this. Not like this. Right? I'm building that house with my life. For that life is the Lord's. Pressing on. And we need to continue to build for his kingdom until he takes us home. That's the retirement party right there. We may slow down as we get older, as we, as we get that AARP card. I may lose a step or two. But I want to keep on building until I hit that finish line. I want to finish strong. I want to strain for it, like Paul said. Back to Hebrews, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That passage is from Psalm 95. It starts out, Therefore, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. So when we hear his voice, as the Holy Spirit speaks to us, a still quiet voice, we have to be careful not to harden our hearts to what we hear, right? God brought the Israelites out of Egypt after that day of Passover and done such a miraculous work. You know, they put the blood the lentil. The angel of death passed over those who had the blood and then led them out of Egypt and on dry land across the Red Sea. He led them up right onto the border of the promised land. He's like, yes, we're ready. We're going in. 
So they send out some spies into the promised land to go check it out to see all this good stuff that's going on. And most of those who came back to spy out the land were like, dude, there's some giants in that land. We're not going to be able to do it. Moses and Joshua, a few of these guys are like, what are you talking about? Did you see what God just did? He just wiped out a whole bunch of Egyptians and led us through the Red Sea on dry land, and now you're worried about a couple tall people? Really? The Israelites hardened their hearts. They didn't want to listen. They didn't want to have that faith, that trust. What does that sound like? Sounds like me. I'm the same way. The Lord has done so much in my life, day after day, and led me through so many trials and tribulations that most of the time I brought on myself. And yet when I get faced with the next one, I dig in. I can do this one. Right? I've got that. Obviously, you're busy, but I'm going to take care of this one. And it just crashes and burns. I do the same thing. I harden my heart. Don't harden your heart. Don't provoke God. He sent them into the wilderness for 40 years. I've been into the wilderness. It's not a fun place. Don't harden your heart. And those that did not trust him were not allowed to enter into his rest. They were left there in the wilderness, right? Forty years. All those people who did not choose to be faithful were left there in the dust. Think about those words for a minute. Entering into my rest. That just makes me relax. Right? Enter into my rest. That's the rest home I would be interested in. It's got the big sign out front that says, His rest. That's where I want to go. That's the place I want to be. I don't want to be striving and, and fighting and frustrated, right? I don't know if you've been there, but I've been there. Kind of trying to make it on my own and it's just not working out and I keep coming up against roadblock after roadblock. Stressed out and whining. Do I whine? I can whine. No, I want to be in his rest. I want to be there in a place of rest, of faith, of obedience and trust. This makes me think of Psalm 23, doesn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides what? Still waters. The Hebrew of those, that, that word, those words right there is actually waters of rest. He leads me besides waters of rest and he restores my soul. So when he speaks to you, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Listen and trust and obey. It's in that place of obedience that we find rest. That's where we find rest. That's when we're in God's will. It's where God wants you to be. It may be difficult because God asked us to go through difficult things. We were asked to suffer as Jesus suffered. But he will be there with you and he will be leading you and that's where he wants you. He will enable you and give you strength. And that's a place of rest. Where else would you rather be? And it also may be a place that you don't want to be. He may lead you to a place where I don't really think I want to be there. But that's a place of rest for you. That's where God wants you to be. You're saying, but there's giants in the land. But if you trust him, you'll trust, he will be with you and he'll give you rest as you follow him. And if you don't, you will be miserable. Take my word for it. 
The Lord led us down here from Connecticut back in 2004, and we stayed three years. And we missed home so much. We missed our family, we missed our church, we missed everything. That we took an opportunity to go back. And we lived there for a year. And it was probably the most miserable year of my life. I don't know about the rest of my family, but it was horrible. Because guess where the Lord wanted us? Here. So he said to me, Jonah, I don't want you in Tarshish up there in the northeast. I want you in Nineveh. Not that this is Nineveh, but this is where he wanted us. And so he let me go. He let me take my family up 1,300 miles away back to where we came from. And everywhere we went, he was there crowding us back to where we were supposed to be in his rest. And it's not been easy here. And look at the journey that we've been on. And now we can start to see what his intentions were, what his plan was, and, and the fruit of that. And now I can say, yes, Lord, I've learned from that experience. And, I'm, and now daily I try to listen, and I try to trust, and I try to obey, because that's 10 miles of bad road, man. I don't want to do that again. Verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. He says, take care or take heed, lest you fall away. The Greek word there is the word we get apostasy from. Take care lest you fall away due to an evil and unbelieving heart. So what's the best preventative for this? How can we keep ourselves from falling away? What's it say? It says, we'll exhort and encourage each other. Right? Every single day that no one's heart may be hardened. I don't think we appreciate the, eva the value of encouragement enough. The value of encouraging one another. We are a relatively small fellowship here. And I think that's a blessing. Because we know everyone here. And it's fairly easy to get to know everyone here. And take, I, I encourage each of us to take the time to do that. If you haven't talked to someone yet, go up and introduce yourselves to them. Encourage them. Spend some time with them. Life is hard. And such, it's such a blessing to come here to this hospital and get encouragement and to get prayer and to get cared for and to get loved. That's what we're here for. Encourage one another. Get their phone number. Give them a call and let them know you're thinking about them, you're praying for them. No one should ever feel lonely here. No one should ever feel lonely. And it's our job to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's the real benefit of being a smaller, more intimate fellowship is we don't want people to get lost in the crowd. We want people to feel welcome and loved here. And I love that. I always want to keep that. I have no intention of building a huge church here. If we get big, we'll go plant another church. Let's keep it smaller. Verse 15, it says, As it is said, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who are those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So the disobedience mentioned here in, in verse 18 is an outgrowth of the unbelief, right? Mentioned in, in verse 19. The unbelief came first, and then the disobedience. In a New Testament context, our belief centers on the superiority of Jesus. That's what we're talking about through this book. The superiority of Jesus. 
the truth of who he is. Consider Jesus, right? That's how we started. Fully God and fully man. And his atoning work for us as a faithful high priest. And we trust in these things, making them the food of our souls. That's how we enter into God's rest. We trust in those things. That's the food for our souls. Nothing the world has to offer. That's when we enter into his rest. Israel's great failure was not to persevere in the faith. After crossing much of the wilderness, trusting in God, and after seeing so many reasons to trust in Him, they end up falling short, don't they? Because they didn't persevere in the faith and His promise. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. How many of you are familiar with that book? Books about... It's an interesting perspective that C.S. Lewis took. It takes the, the perspective of the devil and his demons and how they're out to destroy believers. And it's written with a perspective of how the, the devil and the demons are out to get us. You get into almost, C.S. Lewis gets you into the inner workings of that and the conversations. It's fictional, but it's real. And I've got a quote here from, from that book that kind of talks to what we've been talking about. It speaks to the difficulty of persistence and persevering from attempting demons' fictional perspective. And I quote, The enemy has guarded him from you through the first great wave of temptations. But if only he can be kept alive, you have time itself for your ally. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather. You see, it's so hard for these creatures to persevere. The routine of adversity, the gradual decay of youthful loves and youthful hopes, the quiet despair, hardly felt as pain of ever overcoming the chronic temptations with which we have again and again defeated them. The drabness which we create in their lives and inarticulate resentment with which we teach them to respond to it. All this provides admirable opportunities of wearing out a soul by attrition. If, on the other hand, the middle years form prosperous, our position is even stronger. Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it, while really it is finding its place in him. That is why we must often wish long life to our patients. Seventy years is not a day too much for the difficult task of unraveling their souls from heaven and building up a firm attachment to the earth. Gives you a perspective, doesn't it? And so as we look back over this chapter, there's so much here. What have we learned? What can we take away from this? The first thing that comes to mind is considering Jesus. Consider him. Take some time today and really thoughtfully consider Jesus. And who he is and, and what he's doing in your life. Consider that. How does he fit into your life? And how do you fit into his kingdom. And then ask people around you the same question. Consider Jesus and who he really is. And how does he fit into your life? And, and how do you fit into his kingdom? We've learned we're all apostles and we're all priests. We've been sent and we're ministers. And we need to be faithful to our calling, right? We need to be faithful. And again, Jesus is superior to all, including Moses. And so let's consider also our lives. Give some time to examine our priorities daily. What's our focus? The creation or the creator? The building that we labor on each day. 
which is the work of our lives. And if the chief building inspector came to walk through that building that you're building and took a careful look at it, what would he say? So when you, and we also learn when you hear from the Lord, when we do hear that still quiet voice in our hearts, when you know that you're hearing from the Lord, don't harden your hearts. Have the faith and the courage to be obedient. That's the part of the house that God wants you to put your work into. Right? When you hear that voice, when you get that direction from the Lord, that's his guidance to you as to the part of the house that he wants you working on now. Don't labor in vain. You're a priest. Put your labor into the Lord's work. But that's where we find rest. That's where we find rest. People spend their lives in the Western world trying to find that thing that will give them peace. Just ask someone, what are you after? What is it that you're looking for? You know, they're looking for peace or fulfillment or something to fill that gap that they have deep down inside. They spend all their lives trying to find it. And the only place that you find that is in a close, abiding, intimate relationship with the Lord. Amen? That's the only place you find that. He's our rest. Being in a place where we are faithfully spending the time to listen to His voice and walk with Him is that place of rest. It's that place of peace that so many are looking for. And that's all we have to share. Like, dude, I've got that rest. And it can't be found in the stuff out there in the world. It's not found in the creation. It's found in the Creator. He's our rest. And that's where I want to be. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, we, we earnestly yearn to be in that place of rest, to be in that, that place where you want us. A place that you would have us to be to do your work as priests and as ambassadors. So Lord, this morning as we bow our heads and, and we examine ourselves and we consider Jesus we consider the work that he's done in our lives. And we consider what we're living our lives for and, and that building that we are building each day. Lord, we're, our desire is that we want to use gold and silver and precious stones as our building materials and not stubble. We want to work on that part of the building that you want us to be working on and not distracted by the other stuff. We thank you that you have given us life everlasting. And now we get to live that life for you. We get to be used by you and live our lives out for you. And there's no other place that we'd rather be, Lord. There's no other place where we can find the peace and contentment that that brings. Because I know I've tried. And so, Lord, this morning... My prayer is that each and every one of us would find that place of rest and live our lives in total surrender and commitment to your will from this day forward through your strength and through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.